Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the M. Lewis Tiffany Endowment, the Hideko Tomazawa Endowment, the Physics Department, and by gifts from friends of the program. So I was, I was hoping to tell you today about capillarity, and my main goal is that you walk out of here and that you can look around your daily life and see some aspects of this, and this will give you some further appreciation of it. Um, so let me tell you what capillarity is first. Um, it's basically everything that has to do with surface tension. Um, any phenomena that is driven by surface tension is what I'm calling capillarity. And surface tension, everybody, I think, has some idea of it. Um, it's what controls the shape of the liquid at the very top of this uh, glass of liquid. So this is just water, and at some point there's, the water ends, and surface tension is telling you something about the shape of that. Um, why is the one question to answer is why is the surface special? Um, and to, to, to see why it's special, we've got to first look at the interior of the liquid. If I, if I had my zoom microscope and I could look at what the atoms are doing at some point here in the interior, what I would find is that every atom is more or less surrounded by an equal number of atoms. And so on average, the forces, which, which are always going on, all the atoms, the, the, it, when you have a liquid, the atoms are interacting. Um, they're repelling and they're attracting. That's, that's why it's a liquid. They can't get too close, but they can't get too far. So there's some interaction going on between them. And the net force that any particle, uh, any, any particular atom experiences, is more or less uniform. It's the same in all directions. If I go to the surface, though, things change. Because when I get towards that last few layers of atoms, then the atoms that are on the surface and a little bit below it no longer see the same number of atoms in all directions. So the, so the interactions that are at play there get biased towards the liquid side. And that, and that ends up producing a net force that is pulling those atoms on the surface towards the bulk. Um, Any time you have a surface, you have surface tension. And so, that, and so the, with the glass of water, on one side was water, and on the other side was air. And I didn't show you anything about the air. But there are gas uh, molecules there, and they exert some force. But there's very few of them, so it really makes not much of a difference. But if I have something like oil and water, I still have an interface. And at that interface, there is some difference of balance of the forces. Because the oil atoms want to be next to each other. The water atoms want to be next to each other. And there are, so, so, the, so there's a different set of forces between those atoms, um, between the oil and the water. And that also leads to an imbalance which means that at the interface between the oil and the water, you end up with some, with, with some type of forcing. Um, the net effect of this is that on everyday objects that you see, um, whenever there's a surface, what, what the physics wants to do is it wants to minimize the energy. It, it wants to make that the energy that that surface cost me, I want to make it as little as possible. But it shows up in all sorts of aspects of your, of your life. So in the first panel, there's, there's mercury. When I was a kid, it was still OK to play with mercury. <laughs> uh, and it was fun. Um, here's, here's the usual meniscus thing. It just it, um, at, at the top of this graduated cylinder, you see the meniscus. 
where the shape has been deformed by the capillary forces, that surface tension in action. Um, on, the, on the right panel is some waves the, that are being generated on a thin film. This is, this is a very common sculpture these days. You, you get film flowing down a thing, and you see these beautiful things that are called capizza waves, named after the same person who discovered uh, superfluidity. Um, here is uh, oil spreading on water. The reason you see this, you see this beautiful rainbow, is because of surface tension in action. Here's our dog, after having been dunked in the water. Um, but this is exactly the same phenomenon as if you ever painted. You, you dip your paintbrush in the liquid, and before you do that, it's all raggedy. And then when you, when you pull it out, it all comes together. That's surface tension in action. And in the final panel, here's the second best footballer in the world, um, showing us a little fluid dynamics, how how this jet of liquid coming out of his mouth disintegrates. And so I'll have a little more to say about that in the end. Um, surface tension plays an enormous role in the biological world. Um, the one that everyone knows is duck, you know, water off a duck's back. That's what the first panel shows. Um, it's, it's a drop of water sitting on a feather. And what you can see is that the feather somehow is able to reject the water. Well, what, what we would say is that the surface tension is, is, the, uh, is very high there, and so it keeps the water from entering the, the, uh, 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 the feather. Uh, on the top panel is a water strider. There are, there are some insects that can walk on water, and what they're actually using is they're using um, just surface tension to, to hold themselves above the water. And we have a small demonstration of this. Let's see if we can. Yeah, I'm going to give this a try. So here's our fake water strider. Let's see if I can do this delicately enough. There we go. So there it is. So surface tension. So there's a, so there's a competition of forces here. Gravity wants to pull that thing down. Surface tension in here is, is acting as a force that is pushing up on the legs, and it keeps the thing floating. And that's what insects use. Insects are actually very clever. They can actually manipulate the shape of the liquid and propel themselves in this way. One of my favorite examples is uh, the way uh, mushrooms get their spores out of, out, of, uh, out of the gills. It's only certain classes, but they have these, they have these spores. And what, what they use is a drop that collapses onto the spore and shoots it out like a cannon. It's really an amazing process. And on the far panel is just a, a, I forget the name of this fish. I should have looked it up. But it uses spit to capture its prey. You, so you know the name? The archerfish, I believe. Archerfish, thank you. So, um, so the, 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 there are a couple of ways to think about this. Where is there? I love bacteria on here. <laughs> um, OK. So I don't actually love bacteria. <laughs> but what I did want to say is that there are, a couple, there are two ways to think about um, surface tension. One is that it's the energy cost of having a surface. And so if I, so, so here's, here's an equation which is accurate. It says that the energy of having a surface is equal to the surface tension times the area of whatever object I'm, I'm interested in. And surface tension here is a property of the interface. So you give me, you tell me what's on either side of the interface, and I will tell you the number that is the surface tension. So it is a property that's fixed, like the density, like the specific heat. Um, so, so that's one way to think about it. And this tells you why surface tension tends to make things round. This is a bubble. OK, I see why it says I love bacteria. Um, this is a bubble, and you can ask, why is it round? Well, the answer is simple. That's, that's the way you minimize the energy of the system. Now, you might say to yourself, well, this sphere has area. Why doesn't it keep on getting smaller? If I make it smaller, I will reduce the surface energy. But what stops it from getting smaller is that there's a gas inside. And if I make it smaller, I've got to compress that gas. So what I end up with is, if this, if here's a plot of the energy versus the radius, as as I increase the radius, I increase the area of the of the sphere. 
so the energy is increasing. But as I, as I, um, as I compress the, the bubble down, I'm compressing the gas, and that costs me energy. So somewhere in between, there's a minimum, and that's where the, that's where the bubble will sit. So that's one way to think about surface tension. It's, it's, it's an energy cost. Um, so there's a, there are nice ways of illustrating this, and let me show you one. So all I'm doing is I have just two plates of which I put these little studs in between. And now I'm going to dip it in and create a soap film in here. And if, I'm, if this works correctly. So I've, I've created a soap film between each one of these studs. And what, what, what the soap film is doing, it's solving the problem. What is the shortest distance between the studs? Because by solving that problem, it solves the problem of energy. How do I make that? How do I make the energy as small as possible? And by making, by making the shortest path, I make sure that I have as smaller areas I, as the bubbles can get. So, so, um, so that's, so a second way to think about surface tension is to think about it as a force. And it's a, it, it turns out to be a force per unit length. And to really see that it's a force, we have another demonstration. And this is called SSS soap scum. It's a pirate ship. It's just a piece of balsa wood with a bit of soap on the back. And I'm just going to drop it in the water here. Which side is closest? OK, and we're going to see what happens. Off it goes. So I didn't give that a, a push. It, it's just going by itself. So let me, let me illustrate that one more time, if I can. I've already contaminated the water with soap, so it may not work a second time, but with some luck, a little weaker. So surface tension is a force. It's a force per unit length. And what's happening in this particular case is that I have the boat, and I have that chunk of soap sitting in the, uh, thank you. Um, so here's my boat. I put in a bit of soap. As soon as, that, as soon as that bar of that little piece of soap touches the water, it starts shedding soap molecules. These are amphiphilic molecules, which means that half of them likes to be in water, the half of them doesn't. But the, but the net effect of the soap is that it reduces the surface tension. So it reduces the surface tension right here. But over here, the surface tension is still strong. And over here, the surface tension is still strong. So what, what that does is it pulls it. So if you, if you can imagine a mat and, uh, made of fibers, and I'm pulling it on the edges, that's, that's one way to think about surface. And now I start cutting little bits of the mat in the interior. Then at some point, I'll start to get a hole. And that's exactly what's happening with the ship. The soap molecules are depositing there. They're decreasing the surface tension. But there's a net force because over here, the surface tension is low. Over here, it's high, and it gets pulled out. And that's what propels that along. Um, the second demonstration is very clear. So let's try that. So this is um, OK. So I put a soap film here, and there is a wire that's sitting in the soap film. But on either side, there's a soap film. And I'm going to pop the smaller one. So when, when I pop the smaller one, the surface tension started acting on the rod and pulled it all the way around. So that's, so that's the other way to think about surface tension, is that it's a force, and it acts on units of length. Um, I'm going to skip that one. So um, 
I wanted to tell you some examples of the th kind of things that we study in, in my lab. And I wanted to first start off with um, well, uh, this first panel is um, coffee rings. So you all, you all have probably had the experience of having to clean up after your coffee. This is um, just dried coffee. Here's a, here's a bit of coffee that hasn't uh, quite dried yet. And the thing to notice is that all along the perimeter of this, of this coffee stain, it's, it's greatly enhanced. And the question is why? And I wouldn't be telling you this if it wasn't related to capillarity. So what's, what's going on? Well, I start off with some drop. Let's just say it's a spherical drop. And it has some stuff inside it, my coffee. But it actually, it doesn't really matter that it's coffee. It could be little plastic particles, which is what we do our experiments on. Or it could be anything else. It could be salt. And what happens is that once the thing dries, all that material that was inside the drop gets pushed over to the edges. And the question is, why? So looking from above, what that looks like is it looks like if I started off with a, with a nice spherical drop, I end up with a deposit where all the material gets accumulated into the, into the side. This, this particular one was made with little yellow spheres, which is why it looks yellow. Um, but all, basically every single sphere in this drop ended up on the edge of it. Um, if, if you were to look with a microscope, what's going on right here, you would see that these particles are flowing towards the edge. So the deposit I showed you is this white band here. And here are these uh, particles looking through a microscope. In this case, those particles were about a micron in size, um, very small. And they're all flowing towards there. So what's happening is it actually turns out to be very simple. Um, if I start off with a drop like this, for reasons which I'll explain a little bit later, if I zoom in on this part, this point where the liquid meets the solid ends, is stuck. It's going to be stuck there for the entire time when the drop is, is drying. So we call that pinned. And we call this, this place where the drop reaches the surface is, we call it the contact line. So it's pinned, but now by evaporation, I'm taking liquid out of the drop. And it turns out that in this case, um, the evaporation out of this drop is strongest near the edge. It's for exactly the same physical reasons that a lightning rod works. Um, but more, more liquid is coming out of this end. But when I draw that liquid out, if I don't replace it, then this, then this contact line will move backwards. But if I've told you it's pinned, it cannot move, if I take liquid out of here, I must bring more liquid in. There's no other way to do this. So that creates a flow. So that's, so that's kind of got the horse before the carriage by saying that this is pinned and that the liquid must move there. What's actually doing it is capillarity. If I... Um, as, as this drop dries, I should think of the upper surface almost like a rubber sheet. That rubber sheet would like to, it's stretched because it has all of this water inside it, but, but the surface tension is, is, is what uh, I'm sort of modeling, trying, trying to have you think about the surface tension as, a, as an elastic sheet. That elastic sheet would like to collapse, but it has that liquid inside. So if I, if I remove liquid from over here, I distort this away from the spherical surface it would like to have. And surface tension acts to restore that. And that's actually what drives the flow. Um, so you can use this to manipulate the way that things get deposited on a surface. So these are various coffee, coffee rings. But this one has been shaped so that it produces much more deposit over here, less deposit over here. You can take this further. You can, if you're clever enough, you can, you can fill something up with lots of particles. And you can make something like a donut using this process. Or you can create these sort of structures by having various drops interact. Um, you can lay down types of patterns that you might want to create. 
You can stretch DNA with this process. You can make nanowires with it. Um, there are a variety of things that, that you can do with this. One of the things I was involved with recently was a, it was a murder trial. And one of the most, uh, w one of the big pieces of evidence was about what is the shape of the, of the deposit of some water on a glass. Uh, it, actually, the case was where, so the, the um, sorry, let, let, let me get my story straight. So these are fingerprints, and that, that's the important part. The question is where, the question that they wanted to ask is where did the fingerprints come from? And the, the prosecution was arguing they came from a CD case, from a DVD case that the murderer had brought into, the alleged murder had brought into the, into the apartment. The, the defense was arguing, no, the, the police lifted this from a glass. And the claim was, well, here are some dried drops on it. Based on the shape of these dried drops, I can tell that this came from a vertical surface and not a DVD. And this was actually an important part of the trial. Um, so it's an unusual way in which capillarity has made its, uh, has been playing a role. All right, um, so I told you about those coffee stains. Let me tell you a little bit about splashing now. Um, so splashing, I like it because it's, it's actually a stunningly beautiful phenomenon. Um, I couldn't get away with doing science on it just because it's beautiful. But um, so let me, uh, I'll, I'll try and give you some reasons for studying this. But first, let me show you what a splash looks like. Oops. So there's a very simple splash. Drop comes down, hits a liquid layer. It sends up a sheet, that, that sort of conical thing you saw, and the edge of it breaks up into a bunch of droplets. Just to, sh just to show that one more time so that you see what I mean. There's that sheet came up. It broke up into pieces. This is a high-speed video, which means that it's taken uh, I'm taking frames at much higher than your ordinary camera, and so I can slow down the action and see what's going on. Um, splashes come in a huge variety of shapes. Um, here's just a, a sampling of them. This is a splash which produces no droplets. It's, um, it's not a very interesting splash. Here's one that produces little small droplets, but nothing uh, later. So it produces little droplets way at the beginning. Here's the one I just showed you, which produces these kind of medium-sized droplets at a late time. Here's, th this one produces little droplets at, a small at early times. This one produces small droplets at little times and big ones at later times. Here's one that just, I don't know how to describe it, it's just messy. And here's one where the sheet has folded in on itself and has captured all of these bubbles on along its rims. So my point, my takeaway point from this is simply that splashes can be extremely complicated. Here's one of my favorites. It's a bit odd to be saying you have a favorite splash, but this is it. Um, so this is, this is what gives rise to this. If you walk, walk around in the rain, you'll see lots of bubbles. That's what's happened. You had a splash that's created this little uh, dome. Um, splashes turn out to be extremely important in various indus industrial and commercial applications. Inkjet printing, spraying of crops. You've, got, you've bought this expensive chemical. You want to you wanna get it onto your crop. How do I make sure that when I spray it, it doesn't bounce off? Um, inside, your, inside your car. Your, your fuel injectors are spraying fuel into the wall of the cylinders. You want to make sure that I get to get good combustion. I want lots of, I want splashing to be a really good thing so that it's, so it gets uh, nicely atomized. Um, sort of the, the physics reason we study these things is because it's an interesting example of nonlinear systems. And I, I'd, like to, I'd like to take a moment because I think it's a, an interesting thing to explain to you. Um, a, lot of, a lot of our thinking is based on what I would call linear thinking. And I have, a, I have an illustration here. And this, this would be something like um, interest compounding in your bank account. 
This equation says, I put in some money this year, next year I'm going to get out the amount of money I put in times some interest rate. So next, so I put in $100 this year, I have 5% interest, next year I get out $105. But I can put that, I can put that $105 back in again, and next year I will get an additional 5% on that $105. So I get compound interest. And I'm sure that everybody has, looks at their IRA and hopes it goes like this. <laughs> um, so that's compounding interest, and it's, and it's growing exponentially. But all I'm ever going to do is get richer. I'm not going to become an artist. That may sound like an odd thing to say. But if I have a linear equation, things, if, if I have a nonlinear equation, things can change. And let me illustrate this. So this is simple compounding. Now, let me, let, let me add a tax, a type of tax here, which, which says, I want to make sure that nobody gets too rich. And what it says is, the more money you have, the higher I'm going to tax you. In fact, I'm going to tax you so much that at some point, um, you, you're, you're going to stop earning money at the end of each year. This actually comes from studying um, it became most famous, this equation, for studying predator-prey models. I have some predator, it's eating, so this would be the birth of some species. This would be the amount of food that's available. There's only a certain amount of food. It, it, at some point, uh, you know, the, the ecosystem saturates. But, but we can still think about it in the, in the money-making thing. But so what happens with time? After each cycle, after each year, I make a little bit more money, a little more money, but then at some point it saturates. <laughs> now, the interesting thing about this equation is that when I change my interest rate, I don't necessarily just change this level. I can get something completely different. Here's one that oscillates. So it's just going up and down. Uh, you know, one year I'm up, one year I'm down. One year I'm up, one year I'm down. If I change it some more, I can get something that's, co that's completely unpredictable, and we call that chaos. So what does this have to do with splashes? Well, splashes are controlled by a, by a single equation. It's called the Navier-Stokes equation. Um, it's a complicated equation, but all of these splashes are described by exactly that same equation. And the only thing that's changing is one parameter in there. But it's exactly the same equation. So, so what's different about nonlinear systems is that I can get different things out of them. When I had the linear system, all I can do is get more of the same. I can get more money. I can get richer. But, but when you have nonlinear equations, I begin to find that I get completely new behaviors as I change small things. And you don't have to change this much. You know, a change of, you know, it could be as small as a hundredth of a percent can change your behavior completely. And so that's, that's primarily my field of study, how, how these sorts of nonlinear systems are affected by the parameters that are entering. What sort of behaviors are possible? And this is kind of like the creative force in the world. I mean, this is what gives us structure. This is, this is why our world is not very bland. Um, so there's, there's, a second, there's, a, there's a second thing I wanted to tell you, which is sort of a physics-y thing. Um, and it's another reason why, why these splashes are interesting. And it's because the actual equations that we use for them break down for a small period of time when we're, when we're working with them. So, 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 I'd like to, so I'd like to show you this example, and then, uh, and then we'll get to why the equations break down. So um, one, of, one, of the, one of the facts of physics is that if I have a bubble, the pressure inside this bubble is going to be equal to the surface tension times its curvature. And the curvature here is the smaller the bubble is, the bigger the curvature. Really big bubbles are very flat, so they have very little curvature. Small bubbles have a lot of curvature. So, um, so here I have two bubbles. The pressure inside here is determined by how sharply curved this surface is. And this one is sharply curved. So now if I, I ask you this, now let me connect these with a straw. What's going to happen? Don't, don't 
they're going to equalize because you would think the pressure is going to be the same. So there's descent. But um, <laughs> this tells us that this curvature is, is bigger than this one over here, which means that the pressure in here is bigger than in here. And fluid is driven by pressure differences. If I have high pressure, low pressure, fluid is going to flow from the high to the low. So what I should see is this shrink. So the good thing is you don't have to take my word for this. So here are two bubbles. I'm going to make them. So there I've made two bubbles that are the same size. But now I'm going to make one smaller. I'm going to let the, so there's pressure inside there. And the pressure is higher than atmosphere, so it's pushing the air out. So now I've made the one on my right smaller than the one on the left. And now I'm going to connect them with a straw by opening up the connection. Let's see what happens. Now, I, I would kind of panic if, if I didn't know physics worked. <laughs> But it is shrinking. The one on the right is shrinking, as, as predicted. Boom. OK. Um, the, the point I wanted to get across with this thing is that if I have this relationship, the pressure change is equal to the surface tension times the curvature, then I have a problem when I have a splash for the following reason. This is a drop captured a few microseconds after it's touched the layer of liquid down here. And I want you to notice something. Right here, there's a curved bit. And that curvature is really high. In fact, if I back this up a little bit in time, the region of that contact is going to shrink, it's going to shrink, and it's going to go to essentially 0. So the curvature is related to the radius of that. But as the radius shrinks, the curvature is going to infinity, which means that the pressure at this point here is going to infinity. And the problem is, is that our equations cannot handle that. And that's one, of, that's one of the interesting things. How, how can our equations go through this singularity and still work? How do we connect the two sides of this? So that's one of the more physics-y aspects of the splashing. Um, so I was going to uh, sort of break down what a splash looks like. And here is a simulation of what a splash looks like. So there's the jet coming out of the sides. So the drop came down. The blue is just the liquid. I've just marked it blue because it was convenient uh, to mark the pool differently. And then that jet comes out, and it develops that bulge over there. Let me show that again. So the drop comes down, sends out a jet through the side. I'm only showing you a cross section here. That jet becomes thick here. And eventually, in time, it will break up. So, so, here's, so there's the drop. It came down. It sent up these jets. And then the edge of that jet becomes thick by capillarity. So if I think of that jet is like a sheet of liquid, but it has an end to it. And that end. So you, you would think if I have a sheet and I want to minimize the area, what I should do is contract down to a sphere. So it does that, but it doesn't do it everywhere at the same time. Because over here, it's flat, and it's quite happy. Surface tension is satisfied. The force is the same in all directions. But over here, surface tension is unbalanced. And so what it tends to do is it tends to pull it in. And as it pulls it in, it starts eating up the sheet. And as it eats up the sheet, it swells up and becomes bigger and bigger. So that's what happens with that jet. It's getting this bulge here. So there's the drop coming in. This is an x-ray picture. Um, 
Here's the drop coming in, there's the jet coming out, and here's the bulge developing. Um, you can see this in action with the following. So that's, that's the simplest type of splash. It just goes up, it, 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 the sheet comes up, the end starts to contract, it develops this rim, but, it never ha but nothing much happens after that. What, 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 typic, what, what, you're used, what you may be used to seeing is that this, that fat bit at the end begins to become corrugated. It becomes corrugated through an instability and then breaks up. And so that's exactly the instability that's at work here is exactly the same thing that you would see at the, at the fountain at the airport. If, if, you, if you look at those jets that come up carefully, you'll see that just before they hit the liquid, they start to break up. Um, and that's surface tension acting to break them up. And I have an explanation for you. It comes back to the same relationship that the pressure inside of the liquid is related to the curvature of the surface. So imagine I started off with a straight tube. So I have a straight tube. The curvature is the same everywhere. But now, it, say I pinch it at this one point. I've pinched it at this one point. Its curvature has become smaller. Sorry, its curvature has become bigger. Its radius has become smaller. Its curvature has become bigger. Its pressure gets higher. So where I pinched it a little bit, the pressure has gotten high. So that means the water is going to flow away from it. So water flows from high to low pressure. So that's what happens. If I ever get, for a random reason, I get a little bit of pinching, the pressure gets high, and the water flee it flees. And that means that it, it, it causes this nice cylinder to break up. And so that's what causes the drop to break up into these little droplets. So this is actually a picture of the drop looking from below. This is the instability beginning to start, and this is, this is that instability at much later time where it's beginning to produce droplets. Um, so I'm not the first to look at splashing. This is Leonardo da Vinci. Um, he, he has this picture of what looks exactly like a splash. And you would think that this paragraph would have some deep significance. And so, so I finally tracked down the translation. I mean, not as, as you know, it's backwards. And it's also in Latin. Um, but I tracked down the translation. And it says nothing about this. So, <laughs> so I, it, it, it was like a doodle for him. Um, but a lot of people have looked at this. Um, sort of the hero of this was a, was a guy called Worthington who actually worked at a, at a high school near where I was, uh, where, where I was a professor at uh, Bristol University. And almost at the dawn of photography, he started taking pictures. Actually, before this, he was sketching them. He would, he, he would look at it, and he would quickly sketch. And then, then photography was invented, then flash were invented. And this is his flash. And but I, I just want to take a moment to, to, to describe this little bit of the apparatus, which I just think was, was, was genius. OK, this is, this is his apparatus. These two things here are pivoted arms. And when this magnet in here is released, those two arms do this. They just flop down. Here's a steel ball. On this side, he would put a drop. And when, when he would release the magnet, the steel ball would drop through here. It would create a spark, which would trigger his flash. At the same time, this would fall down and hit the surface, and he would get the, uh, he would get the flash. So I think this is just beautiful. Um, I wish I could design experiments like this. Um, so what, what we do, we have to do something a little better. It's a, 100 years later. So what we do is we, we do x-ray imaging. And the reason we do x-ray imaging is because we can't see in the interior of the drop. This is, this is what a, a splash would look like if we were trying to see it with a regular camera. Um, we really can't see the structure that's inside there. With the, this, is, this is an x-ray picture of exactly the same thing. And what we see is that there's actually two jets. There's one here 
and there's one here. Um, this x-ray thing works like this. You send a splash down, you send the x-rays through, they hit a crystal which turns the x-rays into visible light, and then you film it with a high-speed camera. Um, the experiments look like this. They look really complicated because this room is set up to do anything. This is at Argonne National Laboratory. It's a national facility. Um, but here is the liquid. This is where the drop comes from. These are triggers, much, much uh, less elegant than uh, Worthington's. Uh, and this is the film, this is the camera that captures the scintillation crystal, the one that turns the x-rays into light. Here's one to capture it with regular light. And this is where the x-ray beam comes from. And it has to be so complicated because we can't be in the room. These, these x-ray beams are tremendously powerful. Um, I have a movie which I'll be happy to show you afterwards of, of how, what's involved in actually setting, uh, doing an experiment. It's kind of fun. Um, Basically, the experiment is in here, and it all gets sealed by, by these lead doors. Um, but this is, this is sort of what it would look like. This is what you get from those types of experiments. You get movies like this. It's hard to see. So here, let, let me take out some stills from you. So on the, on the right, you can see that first this small jet comes out. It keeps on growing, but then gets pulled back. This other thing grows up and forms another jet. So one of the things that this x-ray showed us was that there actually, there isn't just a single jet that comes out when these splashes happen. There can be multiple jets. Um, here's a simulation which shows this a little more clearly. So the white thing here is the interface. It's hard to see. The colors are related to how much the liquid is, is the quantity called the vorticity, which tells you how much the liquid is swirling. But so there comes that first jet. It's developing that bulge I told you about, the one that comes from the ends of sheets contracting. And then the second jet comes out of this place here. And actually, it's generated by this vortex, which is, which is being produced here. So who would have guessed it's all of this is going on. Um, so um, back to this. Um, so it turns out that 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 if we if we understand how these jets come out, we can actually unravel the structure. I showed you all of these complicated splashes. You can actually begin to understand where this complication comes from by studying the number of jets that come out. And so here's an example where I'm producing little droplets. Here's another jet coming out, which will produce drops later. And you can sort of uh, interpret why, why splashes look like they do by understanding the, the number of jets that come out. Um, the final thing I wanted to do, but I'm sort of running out of time, so I'm going to keep this. I'm just going to show you a movie. And hopefully you'll find it fun. Um, so this is an experiment we did. We have what's essentially a very expensive speaker, which drives this thing up and down. And this is a wedge. And I have a little drop sitting here. And gravity is pointing downwards. So you know, this is kind of like the situation when you're driving in your car, you've got a drop sitting on your windshield. Okay. Now, if I took your car and I shook it up and down, what would happen to the droplet? It would fall down. So let's see. So there I'm shaking it. Here's, here's the wedge. I'm shaking this thing up and down, and I'm trying to study how it's going down. But I'm also I'm increasing the rate at which it's shaking. Okay. We have to wait for it. <laughs> we 
so I have a long explanation of why this is like this, um, but I'm going to skip it. Um, <laughs> Um, and I, I, I wanted to take the final 10 minutes to, to, to show you just a couple of things. So I, as I said, part of my goal was I hope that you leave here and you say, oh, you know, that's related to surface tension. You know, I wonder how it works. So, so, I, so I'm going to leave you with a couple of mysteries, things that I don't understand. Um, here's the first one. So during the fall, I began to notice that if you uh, these maple leaves, for whatever reason, this is exactly the same day, a few inches apart, maple leaves always beat up on this side, but never on this side. And they're very strange. Um, there's actually a well-known phenomena which, which, uh, which plants in rainforests adopt, which is the side that faces the rain likes to shed water. Otherwise, they're in trouble. Right? They get crushed by the rain. But this is exactly the reverse. I have no idea why. Um, so it's a mystery to me. And if anybody knows in the audience, I'd be very curious to, to, to hear. Um, second mystery I want to show you, which is more, more science-y, uh, I hope. Um, you can get drops to levitate by putting them on a hot surface. You will, have, you, you will have noticed this if you ever try, if you ever uh, have a frying pan at home and you drop a, a liquid drop on there, you'll see that it'll float around almost without friction. So that thing is actually levitating on its own vapor film. Um, what's happening is that the, the drop, which is, which is sitting at, say, 100 C, the, the um, the evaporation temperature of, uh, of water, it's, it's pushing out a vapor film, and it acts sort of like a rocket, which is pushing it up. So, so the vapor that's coming out of this drop has to escape through here, and that creates this upward pressure. But so the thing I wanted to show you is what happens in certain circumstances. So what I'm going to do is sort of the reverse experiment, in that my substrate is hot, but only hot compared to the liquid nitrogen, which is very cold. So, so what's, what, what's going to be hot here is this layer of glycerin that I put in the, in the beaker, in this Petri dish. And, and what's cold is, is the liquid nitrogen. So let's see what happens. So you see these things. Uh, so somehow, this, this drop has organized itself into these, with, with these surface waves. And nobody understands why. I'll show you a, a high-speed movie of this so you, so you see actually what's happening. So each one of those little stars that you saw is doing this sort of motion. These little chunks in here, I think, are, are, are uh, frozen oxygen. So it's a beautiful phenomenon. Nobody knows how it works. And with that, I'll finish up and just leave up the list of the people who have who've been involved in these things and some other things. All right, thank you. Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the M. Lois Tiffany Endowment, the Hideko Tomazawa Endowment, the Physics Department, and by gifts from friends of the program.